Hello everyone. Welcome back to Draw Sessions, where I help you become a better artist. Today, we are drawing Bigfoot, slash Yeti, slash Sasquatch, slash the Big Ape Man. And it's been requested, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to sketch Sasquatch today. Uh, I love drawing this thing. I, I typically don't show my Bigfoot drawings because, quite frankly... I draw more insectoid creatures than anything else, but Bigfoot is an exception because it's so methodical. We all know Bigfoot, abominable snowman, even if you want to call it that. And whether or not you believe in Bigfoot or not, you can definitely agree that it is a polarizing beast. Some argue that it's not even a bipedal monkey ape creature from Earth, that it's actually from another dimension, and it comes through with a time slip or... You know, Native Americans say that it came from, uh, they talk to it because it it came from space or a different dimension. Like, there's all kinds of origin stories with this thing. So, what I want to talk about today is how I approach my sketching. And you'll see here, like, you know, the focus is on my hand because I want you to see how I'm holding the pencil. I get asked a lot, like, how do you keep your drawing so clean? without using an eraser. And I say, well, my hand stays off the paper. Have you ever noticed that the more you shade, the more your palm tends to rub across the page because you're trying to shade bigger areas? Well, that's what, I mean, you're getting the oils all over that paper. When you get oils on the paper, it is not coming up. Regardless of how many times you use a kneaded eraser, a gum eraser, whatever eraser that you want. So, it's best to try your best to keep it off. Now, I'm right-handed, so I move from left to right. So all the details start on the left, and then I move gradually to the right. Or I start at the top, and I move down. Now, if you're left or right-handed, you can, you can operate like that. If you're, if you're a left-handed artist, you, just, you can just start on the right side of the page and then move, gradually move left. I, I really enjoy moving it like a... Downward 45 degree angle whenever I sketch, and you'll see that. So, uh, again, like you know, the focus right now is just how I'm gripping that pencil. Well, I mean, we're starting with the basics today, folks. Okay, how I'm gripping that pencil, how loose it is. I'm putting the majority of the emphasis or the majority of the details today on this face, on the head area, because this is the selling point. If you're a creature concept artist or character concept artist for that matter. The selling point is always going to be your focal point. Please remember that. You can have a very huge, well-drawn, illustrious illustration. If you have the same amount of detail, especially with a pencil, if you have the same amount of detail from top to bottom, it's going to be overwhelming. Open your sketchbook right now and ask yourself, why do your drawings look flat? Because you're spending way too much time with the details and less time figuring out the atmosphere that those details are sitting in. So you'll see that today's sketch of Yeti uh, slash Bigfoot, you're going to see atmospheric perspective being added, and I'll, I'll walk through that process here in a couple minutes. Atmospheric perspective, I'm going to, get, I'm going to pull back. So there's a lot of discipline involved. And pulling back with your concept. So what that means is, you know, back in the day when I started in this industry, I wanted to show everything in a drawing. Like everything. Every single scale, every single hair, every single leaf in a tree that was 20 yards behind the character. Nobody cares about that. As a matter of fact, you have to have your eyes resting. Think about all your favorite character concept artists that, you know, for like Overwatch and uh, Gears of War, you know, all different types of games. And, and look at the armor. Just look at the clothing, especially the armor. What makes that armor successful? You're resting your eyes in certain areas. Okay. So you'll see here that I'm applying more details to Sasquatch's face. Uh, this Sasquatch is not a friendly fellow at all. I tend to like the meaner side of creatures because when 
you know, maybe it's the movies that I grew up with in the 80s, you know, like like Predator, Aliens, American Werewolf in London, even even Bigfoot and Harry and the Hendersons. It was scary. I mean, things like Seven Feet, you know, Kevin Peter Hall played it. And he also played Predator. You know, but that's besides the point. But with me and this Bigfoot that I'm sketching here, I want to convey a sense of dominance, power, and it knows something that you do not. And probably the biggest thing that it knows, well, two of the biggest things. One, it can crush you at any time at once. And two, you're not supposed to be there. That's not your territory. So how am I going to convey this in just a sketch? Well, be sure to watch this entire thing so that you know how I'm adding the shading, the core shadow, the specific details. I'm pulling back on certain areas. And I... and. I want you guys right now to, to sit back, grab your sketchbook, and draw along with me, okay? And maybe you can draw a Bigfoot. Maybe you can draw the Bigfoot that I'm drawing or make up something. But try this. So uh, whenever I do creatures and characters, I put the majority of the details on that face because personality dictates the rest of the entire image. It even dictates the nature and the environment that it walks out of and that it lives in. How does it do that? Well, typically, an animal is a product of its environment. All right? What hairy lizard do you know lives in a cave? Doesn't happen. Okay? What, what, uh, what bird, you know, like what bird in the Arctic is completely hairless? That doesn't happen. Penguins have hair. It has specialty hair. So with Bigfoot... Most of the time, I, I've never heard of a Bigfoot living near the equator. Correct me if I'm wrong. Do you find Bigfoot in the Serengeti? Nope. <laughs> uh, Singapore? Nope. Where it storms every single day and it's like 85 degrees. I love that, by the way. I love storms. I love hot weather. But anyway, like the, the Sao Paulo, like no, no Bigfoot. There are other creatures there. It's mostly cold climate. So... You're seeing me layer the pencil work now. I have that expression. Okay, the personality is coming through. You can start to see the hints of not necessarily evil. Like, maybe it's not evil. Maybe it's not even grumpy. But maybe the nature of this thing is, I'm territorial. Therefore, I don't need to be nice. Just stay out of my territory. And we're fine. We're cool. So here, I'm putting more emphasis on that brow ridge too. I'm going to darken up the eye sockets. I'm trying to be as simple as possible. Those of you watching, because I always light my subject matters from above. Uh, it just helps keep things simple. I'll give more lessons in the future about lighting things at different angles. You know, how to cast the shadow on the ground and map it perfectly. Those of you that have had foundation studies, like foundation drawing, how to map cubes, cones, cylinders, and spheres. Same thing applies with organic shapes, you know, like creatures, characters, and such. Okay, but uh, the environment that this thing lives in is, is probably cold. You know, we're thinking Northern California, where it gets chillier. It's not cold, but it's chillier. We're thinking some parts of Colorado, some parts of uh, Canada, S Seattle, Siberia, you know, places where Bigfoot, uh, you know what? I actually heard that people are finding Bigfoot in Texas. Those of you watching this right now, correct me if I'm wrong. Are there more sightings of Bigfoot in Texas? I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. So I live right next door to the Appalachian Mountains. There's a lot, you know, the Smoky Mountains is not that far from me, a couple hours you know, through, you got to drive south through Kentucky, Tennessee, parts of Virginia, and then you get into the Carolinas, and Alabama. So there's a lot of mountains and foresty regions over there, too. Bigfoot has been known to be sighted over there. So whether or not you believe in Bigfoot or not, you have to, you have to agree that this creature is pretty polarizing. Uh, I know some of you are going to be happy that I'm actually drawing this thing <laughs> because... Like, I, I ask quite often, hey, what do you want to see me draw? And I'm, I'm getting Bigfoot a lot. 
I've had emails to be like, please draw Bigfoot. I've had private messages on Instagram telling me what I need to draw on YouTube. So I'm like, okay, it's got to be Bigfoot. Uh, the other thing is, you know, this is it's roughly like a 33 minute video. I could sit here and draw Bigfoot for 10 hours. Every single strand of hair, you know, deck it out with trees in the background. Maybe it's holding a dead deer. I like, I don't know. But that's not the important thing about the drawing today. The importance is how can I show you the most with the least? If you can do that as a concept artist, not only will you be successful, you will also get faster at it. Let me explain what that means. Show more with less. You've heard the term more, more is less. Or no, I'm sorry, less is more, sorry. Uh, <laughs> more is less. less is more. Same thing with a portfolio. Okay, so when you're doing a creature, since we're on the subject and I'm a creature designer, most of the influence or most of the, the details and everything are in the face because the face has the personality, has the eyes, has the expression that's going to sit, set you in a mood. When you walk in a museum and you look at all the beautiful paintings that you see that are hundreds of years old, decades years old, look at the portraits painted and look at the environment that the portraits are placed in. Now, yes, there's a lot of detail happening in the, in the different settings. You know, like some are outdoors, some are indoors. You can see curtain details, etc. But a lot of the stuff is in monochromatic shadows and tones. And the spotlight, the highlight is on that face. So it doesn't matter if your creature looks like a human or it has 48 Lovecraftian tentacles coming out of its head with two rows of teeth and eight eyes coming off. There's still going to be a mood established with the head. Okay, get the head done and you will feel better about the rest of the creature. Because a lot of times, if we start with the body first, we're worried about what kind of head looks good with it. Like if I started drawing an elephant body, just this big quadruped thing, and I and all of a sudden the head's too small, it looks like a cat, something doesn't feel right. But if I draw the the head first, it kind of dictates like, oh, okay, well, there's like a ridge of spikes that come down the cheek and parts of the forehead. I'm going to put that down the neck. Oh, and then it's going to run down the back. And you can kind of design by trial and error that way. I did have a set idea in mind when I was drawing this Yeti about what I wanted him to be doing. And he's just, it, it could be a female. I don't know. That's a female, man. I, I don't know what a male would look like. But anyway, it's walking. It's going through its territory. Maybe it's hungry. Maybe it's looking directly at you, telling you, you know what? You came down the wrong path. You need to leave. And I don't have a, I don't have a child right now. I'm single. I'm, I'm, I'm just squatch, man. Just walking through the woods. You got my fish. You can, you could, you could fish here, but just go like 200 yards down. Okay, just give me one. Give me a salmon. It could be doing that. Or it's going to kill you. <laughs> so that expression is ambiguous. And that's another goal that I had with this. So you can see that the majority of the shading is taking place in that head area. You got the core shadow running on its left side. So I'm just doing little oval circular motions over top of my other scribbles. Okay, I'm going to lay down another layer of tone here with graphite. Um, I don't I don't go into too many directions while shading this creature. Uh, partly because I wanted to keep it loose and I wanted to keep it free. So you can look at the creature's arms. I've indicated where the bicep, where the forearm, where the thighs, the knee, the shoulders are. So that it, like, remember, less is more. It's going to leave it up to you and your imagination. It's kind of like reading a book Versus seeing the movie, because if you don't hit the if the movie doesn't hit the mark, then you're just going to go revert back to the book and go, you know what? The book is always better. Very rarely do directors actually take what's in the book and make successful movies out of it. So, so all of you listening right now, like you movie buffs, you know what I'm talking about. Not everybody can pull off a Shawshank Redemption. 
You know, Stephen King was probably very happy with Frank Darabont with that. Same thing with The Mist. Frank Darabont understands Stephen King. Rob Reiner understands Stephen King when he came out with Stand By Me. And then, I, I'm, I'm going to get into detail, but you know the movies that are awful when it came to the book, or some that almost hit the mark. But anyway, back to this. So you're going to start to see me layer on some graphite here, and we've got some atmospheric perspective going on. So what is atmospheric perspective, those of you that have no idea what that is? It is creating a sense of atmosphere within a 2D drawing. And yeah, it seems kind of difficult, but it actually isn't. Your paper that you're drawing on is the environment. Okay, think about it. I'm drawing on moleskin, which is like a creamish color, so it gives me that really cool ancient parchment paper feel. But if you're doing on something on pure white, okay, Think about how you can use that white of the paper to your advantage. Maybe the white of the paper is the highlight and you just start to build values up around a highlight. All right. White paper is, is really fun to use when you're sketching basic shapes, like in foundation studies, like a sphere. You have a spec highlight on the sphere. You do your core shadow. You do your cast shadow on the ground. You've got your contact shadow right underneath where it's like jet black touching the table. All that fun stuff. So for me here, I'm immediately thinking of the environment that Sasquatch lives in. Okay. Kind of damp, kind of cold, uh, wants to be left alone, matted hair. Okay, this thing does not bathe, probably at all. And it's been said that Bigfoot smells worse than a skunk. I don't want to be around that, okay? Skunk smell is awful. I can't imagine what Bigfoot's like, especially if it's close to you, you know, if it like tries to talk to you or something. But anyway, back to the shoulder here. I'm, I'm keeping the atmospheric perspective, like the mist being pushed out of the way. I'm keeping that in an angle. Um, you know, it's funny. I, about seven years ago, I would say, yeah, seven, seven, maybe eight years ago. Uh, that's when I really started to find my style probably thinking like, wait a minute, what? You've been drawing for like 39 years. What do you mean find your style? I'm like, yeah. It Style is one of those things where I want all of you right now to stop worrying about style. Style does not happen by choice, ever. If it happens by choice, you're copying. That's what it is. And we all copy as artists. Like when, when we're learning, we have to. It, it Because we have to build up visual cues and build up our visual library and we kind of, you know, cherry pick different things that artists do and we, and we make it our own. That's what happens when we, when we make styles. Okay. Um, you know, unbeknownst to me, I didn't, I didn't even realize, uh, about the, the, the books growing up. Um, what is it? Are, are you afraid of the dark or something? Correct me if I'm wrong here. But uh, apparently I have a similar style to that. And then it's like a mixture of Frank Frazetta. And I was completely ignorant to Frank Frazetta's work until, I don't know, probably like 10 years ago or something. But even then I was, I haven't even developed my, my uh, sketches yet. So I just kept going. I just kept going, kept going, kept going. And, and you guys will hit your mark. Okay. If you, if you like artists and there are certain painters out there that you really admire, yeah, take little design cues from them. But don't worry about style yet. It will happen. Unexpectedly, too. It'll just happen. I used to belong to a Facebook group. I still am. Uh, Daily Spit Paint. Those of you probably know that one. And I would just do these 50-minute drawings. Uh, just scan it in. and It really helped. But um, back to Bigfoot. This Bigfoot in particular, I'm going to try to keep it as close to the testimonials as I can, you know, big semi bare forehead, pointed forehead, pointed head, actually, uh, large hulking shoulders, big hands, thick body. The majority of the shadow is going to, or the core shadow, cast shadow even is going to be on that left side of the face because maybe the light source is slightly up to our left, but not directly above Bigfoot. So I, I want to give it a little bit of a core shadow. That's what I was mentioning in the beginning of the video about, you know, get your core shadow in, get your shading, get the stance, get the movement, all that stuff. 
I'm adding even more darkness with those eyes because I want them to be piercing. The other thing is, and those of you that are familiar with painting, is that you're probably wondering what to do with the eyes. A good rule of thumb is whatever tone the environment is in is usually going to be reflected in the cornea color. All right. It, so like I'm drawing on cream color because it's moleskin. So you'll see there's a very, very small hint of its pupils or of, of its eyes. It's not pure white and it's not pure cream. I've shaded over that, but you can see it. It's a hint. So if you're doing portraiture, you're doing character work, it's usually the color of the, you know, like the overall value. Um, local color, I guess you can call it. But when you're drawing graphite, it's a local tone. Um, anyway, back to this body. So I'm just going to indicate where that scruffy, unkempt beard lays on Bigfoot's body. And I'm just going to layer in some fur and hair and, and just overall like nastiness. Because again, it probably walks through damp forests and rubbing up against branches with, with morning dew on it. And just you know, overall, not, not a good place to be if you're a person and you, you don't have protection. Um, the, there's the protruding cheeks. I want this face to be very strong. Those are called bony landmarks. So if you're sketching, regardless of what it is, it could be a manatee. It still has bony landmarks. The shapes of all of your creatures and the different sections of the bodies, there needs to be some indication of a skeletal system underneath and or muscles so that we know that underneath the fat, the skin, the fur, the hair, the scales, there is a living, breathing beast that can move around that can eat, that can chase and live and breathe and all that. That's going to bring your creatures to life. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing is like, if you can combine the believability of that with movement, then it's really going to make your creatures look like they can pop off the page. And that's the, let's face it, that's a big goal. All right. One of the, uh, one of my earlier lessons that I posted, it was several months ago, it was the 500 creature thumbnail challenge. And that is you're going to draw 500 creature thumbnails, time yourself two minutes a piece, and you do as many as you can in a day until you get to 500, and you're going to number each one. So where am I going with this? Which is my next point, and that is making sure that your creature looks like it lives in a real environment on your page. You want to make that creature look like it's coming out out of something, living on something. You could do this by simply drawing the ground. If you're doing a, a side 2D sketch, doesn't even have to be orthographics, orthos for short, but just draw the ground plane and all of a sudden you have grounded the creature, okay? So like with me, and you'll see here in a little bit, I draw a rocky ground that it's stepping up on. Okay, just something in nature, just like a hill, an, an outcropping of rocks. And I, I wanted to convey the sense that this thing is moving towards us. There's movement. That's why I dipped the right shoulder. That's why it's kind of reaching forward with its right hand. Its right leg is back. It's getting its balance. It's stepping up on some kind of crevice. Okay. I'm, and here, the to kind of jump to the atmospheric perspective again, less is more when it comes to atmospheric perspective, I'm selling you the fact that it is furry. I'm successful in that because I've put the majority of the fur and the details on its face. So you know that the rest of the fur is chow or is growing throughout the rest of the body. And I'm hinting it very lightly on its shoulders. And towards the end of the video, you'll see that I'm, I drooped or I help the hair droop down like under the legs and the, in the pelvic region, you know, some on the arms, etc. So there's like different lengths also, but there's also fuzziness on the edges. I love doing the fuzziness on the edges. I think I go back to it here in a minute, but, uh, 
that helps with the illusion that it's moving through mist, that mist exists on the page. Those little black marks that I'm putting in right there, it again, less is more, but it's an indication that there is structure happening above the chest. What is the structure? It's, it's his head. It's Bigfoot's head. So we know that the darker the area in shading, that's the area where there's least amount of light. So there's a combination of everything here now. Gestural sketches, or gestural lines. Semi-coated paper, you know, like around the, the right bicep and the chest with graphite. And then slightly more detail on the head. Core shadow and some really dark darks in very strategically placed areas. Again, I could put, I could spend seven, eight, nine hours on this thing. I would love to. As a matter of fact, you're going to be happy. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but uh, I have a camera picked out, and I will be filming drawings that take more than seven hours to do. Can't do it on my phone. It, it, it just it physically, it's not built to hold that length. But you better believe I'm going to be doing some time lapse. Okay, Maybe some scary music. I'm not going to be doing voiceovers for seven hours. Heck no. But, you know, I'll try to set the mood. Um, I could do a voiceover with time lapse also. Have something be shorter. So I love hearing suggestions, guys. Uh, see, I'm adding the fuzziness on the edge. Um, the, the, the pencil shading that's kind of fading off into the distance. I'm trying to show that there is mist and it's moving through substance like there is a physical presence of fog and a thickness in the atmosphere like a damp atmosphere maybe it's in seattle you know where it rains all the time and it's sunny sometimes but uh maybe it's like 5 30 in the morning 6 30 in the morning sun's coming up and it's just moving about its day I'm wondering where it could get fish uh so here I'm just indicating some, some darker fur lines because the shading around it is lighter. So then I know that there's going to be contrast. That's another big thing about the believability and things looking real within your drawings is contrast. That's why your drawings are looking flat. You're, you guys are drawing with the same pencil pressure everywhere. And you're not thinking about dark medium and light treatments with your pencils same thing goes with pen too like a pen you a ballpoint pen just let's keep it simple i did give a a lesson on ballpoint pen usage i'm going to be doing a lot more of that so i i do suggest you check that video out video out too but uh here's where i draw bigfoot's gigantic uh, foot and i just indicate where the toes are and then i draw that little rocky crevice here Man, Big, Bigfoot is huge. Yeah, I, I saw those plaster casts of the footprints that people have found over the years and just, yeah, most of it's fake, I, I think. Um, do I believe in Bigfoot? I, I do, but I do not think that Bigfoot is, a, is an actual mammal. I don't. I think it's from somewhere else, and I think it knows how to slip through into our dimension as a guardian of the forests, like it does not want anything to happen to the forest that we have, because I believe the forests are a gateway to another. I mean, think about Mount Shasta. Like, I don't know if you guys know where that is. You got Joshua Tree. You have all these places, these natural places, beautiful. But there's some weird stuff that goes on, right? Weird stuff. Okay, we're really making progress with this thing. So the, again, the the selling point is that head. We're starting to get a, a better sense of the mood for this creature. Uh, start to indicate some straggling, disgusting fur that's hanging down. You know, so you know it's there. Less is more. You know it's there, but you also fill in the gap. Okay, I showed you what the fur looks like shaded. Just look at its head. Look at its face. Look at its trapezius. Now place that around the rest of its body, and you use your own imagination. And that's what you should be doing to the things that you're drawing, too. Think about a story, okay? Think about, because like a lot of portfolios just lack story. Mine did. Mine did for years. My, like my portfolio for concept art 
it was a hodgepodge of everything because I wanted to do everything. I wanted to do environments and props and creatures and cars and characters and 99% of it sucked and I didn't care. And that's why nobody was calling me back. <laughs> that's why I didn't get an email back. And then, you know, my stubborn self said, okay, Bobby, you have to niche down. So having a niche is, is pretty important. Uh, those of you that are just now discovering my channel, I have a playlist you know, where I talk about the industry standards and how people get hired, how people don't get hired, why they don't get hired, how artists are stubborn to learn new things, um, how stubborn or how artists are egotistical sometimes. A lot of us are. Yeah, it, it sucks, but it's true. And when it comes to learning how to do these things, it's just a matter of actually doing it. So if you're struggling with, with sketching, please know that open that sketchbook, even if it's intimidating, if it's just a white sheet of paper and you have no idea what marks to put down there, just put it down. All right. A lot of art is trial and error. All right. So back to this Bigfoot and you'll see the, the gesture is really starting to take shape now. And, um, uh, you know, we only have a couple minutes left on this thing, but I would really love to hear your thoughts about your struggles you know, like what, so just tell me in the comments, like, what are you struggling with in art right now? And I try to answer everything. And I'm sorry that if I don't get to you, I do hope that you all check the description below so that you can join our creature design workshop discord. Absolutely free. You can peruse the discord. I have a personal work yeah, this is a great one. It's like a personal work channel where everybody's just starting to post their doodles and you got comments and such. If you want to sign up for my actual creature design workshop, I hold it every month. It's four weeks. Okay, um, check out the website in the description below. You can also join the Discord for free if you're not really sure yet. And you can join through the Discord too because I have a channel specifically for that. So it's up to you. You know, but I invite all of you. If you if you want to learn how to draw creatures, we are growing the community every day, and it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of really cool people in there, a lot of good suggestions. It's growing by the day. Okay, so here you can see I'm putting some finishing touches in that area where the shoulder is because, again, Sasquatch is kind of lit from the upper left. So we're going to have that, you know, fading off into the distance, but also you're going to see that shadow. I just want to thank all of you for tuning in today and thanks for sticking around too. There's a lot of really cool stuff that's going to happen with this channel. I wish I can tell you what's about to happen soon, but I can't. Um, but again, if you liked it, please like and subscribe and I'll, uh, I'll see you on the down low. Later.